section of the video, I talked about the fact that I had been involved in a car accident, um, went to massage school, and then started doing yoga. This was probably a year into my practice. Right around that same time, I was working at another health food store, um, and Vernon Smith, Vernon was the owner of a massage school in Baton Rouge that I had become friends with and colleagues. I was cooking at a health food store and Vernon asked me if I would cook for a retreat for massage therapists. There was a CE class or something involved with, um, I forget the name of the, the organization, the AOBTA I think it is. Um, and he needed somebody to cook for this two or three day event. So since I could not afford my continuing education credits, what I did was I went as a cook to prepare food for the 20 or 30 people who were going to this event. At that event, I met a woman who did a temp time massage demonstration. It was on a mat. I had never seen anything like it. I didn't know what it was. And my first thought based on my yoga background, which at that point literally was like a month, a couple months at most, was it looked kind of like kind of an assisted yoga, kind of a passive way of moving people around and accomplishing some of the same maybe stretches. I had a conversation with this teacher and she informed me that she didn't have room in her schedule to take on new clients, but if I was interested in the work, I should see one of her students. I kept that in the back of my head, uh, continued my yoga practice, and maybe six months later made contact with her to make an appointment. Uh, that young lady's name was Kendra Benoit in New Orleans. I had one session with Kendra and decided I would take everything this teacher taught. I was so amazed by the work and it seemed to be a complete synthesis of what I'd been looking for in massage in combination with my yoga practice. During that time, I took classes with this teacher for, I think, two to three years. I took all of her classes. I became a teaching assistant, uh, good colleagues and friends. I would quite literally, um, you know, carry mats, load the car, get her coffee, whatever it was she needed. In addition, I was getting sessions from her outside of class time, and she was teaching me additional things she didn't necessarily include in class. I had been working at that point when I started with her for a year, year and a half, so I was still a young, nimble, precocious, open-minded therapist. And that teacher was an iconoclast, much like myself. In retrospect, I really think she represented a very feminine form of the work, and I really balanced her in a way as a masculine form of the work. In class, we had a tendency to uh, contrast each other in a way that was also complementary. I had a, a keen eye. Um, I could help her in class. When students were having problems, I could go over and assist. Most of the information that you see in the Intro to Time Massage Workbook comes from that teacher and the information that was passed on to me. I worked in various facilities in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, from spas to hairdressing places. I worked at Women's Center for Wellness, I think, for a year. And then finally what happened was every facility I worked in would not allow me to do what I had been taught. They did not allow mat work. So I was put in this weird situation where I knew how to use work that I felt was more effective, but it didn't fit the consumer's knowledge base or employer's knowledge base of what massage was. That began that uh, pushback from the industry that I still get to this day. And what eventually happened was a facility I was working for, Women's Center for Wellness in Baton Rouge, they would not allow me to take off to go assist a class that this teacher was teaching. And I quit, pretty much on the spot. Um, I refused to not allow my practice to grow and develop. I knew this was where I was going. 
and I knew I could just find another job somewhere else cranking out a table massage because people wanted a cookie cutter, a cookie cutter massage in a sequence. From there, what did happen was I continued to practice both yoga and Thai massage extensively, working on clients day in and day out, not intellectual knowledge, but really using the practice. When Hurricane Katrina happened, my teacher moved out of Louisiana, out to, I believe, Oregon, where she still resides. So there was this separation. Um, a year after Hurricane Katrina, I moved to Austin, Texas. My teacher was in Oregon. So the foundational you know, teacher who really gave me a Thai massage practice was gone. And I lived in Austin for about a year trying to figure out what the local culture was like. I thought it would be a bodywork mecca. It turned into a sea of Swedish and deep tissue. There was no Thai massage. It didn't exist. And I was stuck in the same situation again. I worked for a year at a chiropractor's office. I was inordinately excited to work with a medical professional, only to find out that there was this strict top-down model uh, the chiropractor would, you know, do things that I just didn't personally agree with when it came to chronic pain. You know, occasionally mentioned he thought the clients were crazy, that sort of thing, because if it didn't exist on a scan, the, the person wasn't really in pain. And that was something I, I took umbrage with um, because of my own experiences with chronic pain. So to make a long story short, I got a job at a nonprofit in South Austin and put my time massage practice on coast. I still saw some clients, I kept the practice alive, but most of my time and energy went towards this nonprofit as a volunteer coordinator for I believe a couple of years. It, it gave me a chance to develop some other skills, which was like networking, community building, and really just, you have a problem, let's solve it. At the end of that ten tenure at that facility, I decided to go back into where my heart always was with Thai massage. And I gave my former teacher a phone call and said, hey, you know, I studied with you years ago. I, I want to teach. And frankly, I think she was a little bit taken aback because I had never been a very robust uh, therapist. I, w I didn't have a lot of get up and go. I wasn't um, pushing business, in other words. But when she had the phone call with me, she said, oh, you know it. You, you studied with me for years. You, you do yoga. You went over it again and again and again. She's like, you know it. And she said, uh, just make your own workbook. That idea of make your own workbook is where the free time massage workbook came from. That little bit of assistance from her and permission to go teach and then, hey, make your own workbook kind of planted a seed. Uh, since then, I've not maintained real contact with my teacher because she is not really practicing Thai massage, doesn't want to be associated with it, and you'll notice I didn't even mention her name. Um, I've been a little bit concerned about people digging her up and then like annoying her in a way if my notoriety continues to grow, and I don't want people to bother her about you know ancient history that she doesn't want to go over again and again. But for most people in the U.S., relatively unknown. You wouldn't know who it was even if I told you the name. Um, she had studied all over Thailand and years later I come to find out I'm fairly certain she studied with Pichette. I'm, I'm assuming she also did some work with Arno Ermite of Osteo Thai fame and she also probably studied, I, I think I read a blog post where she studied some with Chayut Prisayat. So it was kind of like she went through Thailand and mined out information. But when she presented it to me, there was no tradition in the sense of, you know, honor your teacher, in the sense of why crew, in the sense of let's stick to Thai theory. She was very much an iconoclast, and that's why I was so drawn to the work. So the free Thai massage workbook came out. I continued to work on my business. I started the U.S. Thai Massage Group to draw people together. I started talking to other Thai Massage teachers and quickly found out 
why no one was promoting Thai massage. And it is because people who do Thai massage often are very much fundamentalists. They're promoting a Theravadan Buddhist spiritual tradition. They're talking about lineage and ancestry in a way that doesn't really work for an American audience in my experience. And I found myself even more diverging further and further from what people called Thai massage. I had a great practice. I was still helping lots of clients and educating people, but Increasingly what happened is as I made the videos that go with the intro Thai workbook, as I made the table Thai series, as I made the videos that go with that and I kept going, I had a more clear understanding of I was breaking tradition again and again and again for a form of work that I thought was more effective. Not only from a biomechanical standpoint, but also from a cultural standpoint because I was creating something that a Westerner, a Western therapist, a Western trained table-based massage therapist could take and reboot their practice. So after 700 pages of sequence manuals and what will amount to nine DVDs worth of Thai massage content, I'm essentially going to stop talking about Thai massage and I will start talking about reboot as I'm rebranding to that name. So. At that stage, things really started to take off. I can tell you that I was a bit of a Luddite, and this is what Brenda Ovando was asking questions about. I had a very challenging conversation with my wife one day. I had been gardening, lots of organic gardening. I was harvesting like scrap waste from restaurants and making compost so I could garden for free. Um, I felt like people were disconnected from nature, disconnected from their food in a way that made me uncomfortable. I did not particularly like the changes that I saw with technology. And the conversation I had with my wife was, why don't I have any clients? You know, I must not be a very good, you know, massage therapist or body worker. And my wife told me very uh, clearly that that was absolutely not the case, that my body work was amazing. The challenge was I didn't know how to run a business. And when I said, well, you know, how do I do that? She essentially said, well, you need a website, you need a blog, you need a YouTube channel, you need a Twitter, you need a... Once she hit Twitter, I shut down and said, I have to go do yoga. I can't, I can't talk about tweeting. I don't know why anybody would use Twitter to, I don't understand. I don't understand what that is. Well, what happened was I took my wife's advice. I worked on, with her help, uh, a website. Slowly began delegating. I worked on, you know, what eventually became the, the Time Massage Workbook. I worked on a blog, uh, started the YouTube channel with a flip cam, really horrible quality videos. You can go back to my YouTube channel, go all the way back and see what they looked like. A lot of heart, just not a lot of production value. And I just continued to hack away. And as I continued to hack away from websites, videos, to blog posts, everything started to grow. And it was one client at a time. It was lots of work. What I would tell you is, what I'm teaching you is inordinately simple. It is so simple to do what I'm teaching and build a practice. It's not easy. There's a difference. It is simple but it's not easy. So I just continued to hack away and that led to everything that basically you see in my practice now, including the subscription service. The Luddite portion completely turned on its head. Once I realized what was going on, I saw social media as marketing potential, not let's hang out and keep in touch with our friends. It was less and less that and it was more business. I'll go into more information about Thai Massage Jam and the Massage Entrepreneurs Group in the next video, but I hope you guys are getting value out of these, I don't know, biographical snippets where I talk about my history. Thanks for watching.